Hello everybody, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in the study of the book of Acts, and we've done a lot of, uh, covered a lot of ground already. I think this is uh, part 7 or 8 or 9, I, I don't know, but we're in, in about the middle of chapter 7 now. So we're going to pick up today where we left off last time, uh, chapter 7, verse 36. Before we get started, though, let me ask uh, Brother Joe and Brother Ted to uh, say hi. Um, why don't we have, uh, uh, and tell me also if you have any preference as to who's called on first today, okay? Go ahead. Uh, first, Brother Joe. Uh, this is uh, Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel. Uh, my channel is for fellowship and learning, uh, and uh, uh, I don't teach, therefore I can pretty much say anything and get away with it. These other two guys are uh, have ministries, and so uh, we have to keep a closer eye on them. Uh, I have no preference on who goes first, Luke. Uh, I prefer to be Ted always, though, or you, anybody but me. That way I don't have to think as hard. Back to you. All right, thanks. Uh, so unless Ted objects, we'll, I'll call on him first each time. Go ahead. Uh, say hi, Ted. Hi, everybody. This is Ted, and I'm, my channel is God's Truth Ministries, and uh, I'm glad to be here today after missing the last uh, study, hoping to get caught up, and uh, hope you guys are blessed by this. And uh, my channel, God's Truth Ministries, is basically for getting the gospel out and encouraging the saints uh, to our glorious riches in Christ. So back to you, brother. All right. Um, all right, well, the... Um I'm not going to go back too far, but I, in in kind of um, bringing catching everybody up. I, I hope everybody, when you watch any of my uh, series, that you will start from the beginning. It's going to make a lot more sense if you get everything in context, and you're going to get a lot more out of it. But if you happen to be watching this video without seeing the others, uh, well, I, I hope you still can gain from the, the, that today. But um, we do have all the videos uh, already uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. But going back to chapter 7, verse 1, uh, what we see here is the message that uh, Stephen is making um, because they've, they've, um, uh, he's being held. I, I wouldn't say he, he's under arrest necessarily, but he's being held and he's being questioned about what he's been preaching. He's being accused of blasphemy. So he's uh, he gets his chance to speak. And what he chooses to do is give an entire history of um, Israel uh, from um, even be before, starting with Abraham and, and God's promise to Abraham. And he's going uh, chronologically, just, uh, touching on all the different people and events so um, right now, uh, we'll, we'll pick up with verse 36, but uh, let me see, since Brother Joe was here last time, I just asked you, in terms of just a, an intro or summary, is there anything else you think is important for just the verse? Yeah, uh, you know, to me, it's a fascination that uh, Stephen, the very first martyr, the only person I remember uh, where Christ actually stands to receive him into heaven. Uh, a, a, just a, a brilliant man filled with the Spirit, yet not an apostle. He's the first servant of the church. Uh, he's named first among the deacons, which are servants, love slaves, if you will. And so uh, he goes, for some reason, the Spirit is leading him to go chronologically through the entire history of the Jewish people. Uh, and so I find that fascinating. And, and I'm hoping that Ted or Luke can uh, shed some light to me as to uh, why he's doing that. Uh, I know it's to make points, but uh, there's, there's probably some deeper meat here, and uh, I haven't seen it yet. So I am looking forward to today's teaching. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, well, let me also take this opportunity to uh, give you, Brother Joe, an, an opportunity to see if you've done any, uh, have anything else to say about our disagreement regarding uh, 
uh, this uh, Moses and what uh, uh, this you you thought that <clears throat> now obviously we can take Moses and we can use it as a uh, um, you know the, the, the spirit the, uh, theological terminology would be pictures or shadows and uh, and uh, it, it's there's a um, I forgot the other term that you used last time, but uh, uh, very similar things we see in Moses and some of the, and Abraham and so on that we can see in, in Christ. Uh, we talked a little bit about about that, but we disagreed that uh, I, I was saying that I don't think Moses was aware, and I don't think there's any indication at all that um, from his birth to age 40. When he ends up having to leave in Egypt because he murdered or killed someone, maybe it's manslaughter. But um, those first forty years of his life, there's no indication he had any kind of relationship with God or communication with God, the God, or particularly the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, and then we realize that we see also that he's gone for forty years before God communicates with him. So he's eighty years old before he has any idea. Uh, that God has some uh, plan and use for him, uh, and yet you you thought that he uh, was, uh, I guess, without putting words in your mouth, uh, uh, at that time he was aware, and the Jewish people were aware, that he was claiming that he was going to be the leader of the, the Jewish people, uh, and uh, be, either be king or leader in, in bringing them out of Egypt. Uh, I don't know if I represent your position very well, but you were supposed to take a, a day or two to look further at that. Did you do that, and do you have any more information you can give us? Well, as usual, Luke, sometimes I see things and I run with them, uh, not because of prior learning, just be, because what I see before me. Uh, I did go back, as you suggested, uh, to uh, Exodus in the Old Testament, and uh I found no indication in the Old Testament that uh, Moses had any design or knowledge that he were he was to be uh, the the one who brought his people out of captivity. Uh, I still say, from the reading of this text, that number one, uh, we have to realize that the Holy Spirit is speaking through Stephen. And uh, this is not just historical scripture. This is uh, inspired, God-breathed scripture. And I think it's possible that the Holy Spirit spoke things through Stephen that uh, were unknown to us or to even the, uh, the Pharisees prior to this time. Uh, from the way I read verse 25 uh, through uh, 30, it certainly appears that he had an inkling, at least, that God was going to use him to free his people. Keep in mind, nobody knew that he was a Jew. He had been uh, uh, brought in by the daughter, daughter of Pharaoh, hidden the, the fact that he was a Jew, because the, the Jewish people were frowned upon and slaves in the land. And I'm just going to read uh, a couple of verses here, starting with, uh, with verse 25. Uh, For he supposed his brethren... So now he knows he's a Jew. His brethren would have understood that, uh, let me see, verse 25, for he understood his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. So read verse 25 twice. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how God, by his hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. And the uh, next day he showed himself unto them as, as they strove, and he would have, uh, have set, the, set them at one and again saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you, uh, why do you wrong one another? Any, the, the whole thing is, is it, down here the, the, uh, the Jews, after he killed one of the slave masters, said, uh, uh, you know, hey, who made you a ruler over us? You know, he, it's like they know he's a Jew, and, you know, he wouldn't have gotten in trouble. He's a prince of Egypt. 
He wouldn't have gotten in trouble for slaying a slave master for killing a, a slave. You know, I'm sure that happened just as often as the slave masters killed the Jews. But what the problem is, is they realize that he's a Jew, and they're not accepting him. And they could go and turn him in to the Pharaoh for being a Jew. Hey, your prince is actually one of us. That's why Moses fled. Not because he killed the slave master, but because he had revealed himself to slaves, and they were, they were going to turn him in because they rejected him as a leader of them. And, and it says in verse 25 again, uh, uh, his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them, but they understood not. So it's, it's uh, my understanding, and without babbling any further, that Moses did have an understanding that God wanted to use him to free the, the slaves at that time, but they rejected him. And his fear was not for being turned in for killing a slave master, but being turned in by his own people for claiming he was a Jew and that he would be their king or their savior, but they understood not. That's why he ran, and I think that's uh, delivered through the Holy Spirit, through Stephen, at this time and was not known previously. Uh, back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, 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 the disagreement or the question is based upon the fact that you can you can seem to draw a conclusion based upon Stephen's account. I, I I'm not questioning that from from the verse 25 in the context there. You could draw that conclusion. My point was I don't think it's the proper conclusion because when you go back to Exodus and read it carefully, you're not going to get that indication at all. And when you did go back to Exodus and look at it, you I guess you agree that uh, that wasn't the case at all. Um, so. Uh, um, is, and that that's that was the case, wasn't it, Joe? Before we yeah, on? we're we're in agreement on that point, Luke. Uh, we're just I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing information that was not known prior to this through Stephen, and uh, on that point, uh, that is the inference I draw from what he said there. Uh, okay. Uh, before we get into the text, I'll give uh, Brother Ted a chance, even though. Uh, I don't know how much he could even follow the, the point here without having uh, watched the last video. But uh, do, if you understand the point that we're addressing here, Ted, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, well, just what, what comes to my mind and that I was looking at Stephen's sermon here is that, uh, you know, is that it didn't take long for the persecution to start. And, you know, it looks like he's just given them the council there that he's standing before preaching to, you know, a history lesson, uh, and, uh, you know, st and starting with Abraham, how God uh, was always there working with the Hebrews, you know, and although Abraham technically wasn't a Hebrew, uh, Abraham was a Chaldean, but he was the first uh, father of the Jewish nation. But, uh, you know, there was no Hebrew, I guess, seemingly in existence there. Uh, yet, uh, but uh, so Stephen's just to me showing them and telling them how God has been uh, working all through the Israelites' lives, uh, and he just basically goes chronologically through history there. And uh, you know, God's working miracles; He's intervening with power; He's interceding in their human activities, and it's all in the midst. And I think they they would realize if they if they thought about it while He's speaking. That God was always working in the midst, in their midst, and in their activities, even in their cycles of rebellion, over and over, generations of rebellion. And I'm thinking He's trying to say, look, look how gracious God has been, even though you know, starting with Moses, there was the law, but look how even grace was always at work with God being merciful, uh, you know, providing the uh, you know the Levitical priesthood for for sacrifices and all that. He doesn't get that into that in the text, but he. He talks about how God always was bailing them out over and over and over and, and rescuing them. And ultimately, of course, we know he's going to come to the true rescuer, you know, the true savior, uh, Jesus. I think he's just pointing out to them in their activities, divinely working in their midst, in the midst of their rebellion, and, uh, and that's going to come to a head you know, uh, come to a culmination point when he sends Christ, and that, that I think what it, is what he's leading to, that God's always 
been involved with them in that way. Back to you, brother. Okay. Well, I'm going to move on, but what what you did, uh, brother Ted, was uh, kind of an overview of uh, the, the the chapter, which is fine. But it wasn't. You didn't address at all the the question that I had with Joe. But I don't want to go back again and try to explain it. As I said, you, any viewer that doesn't know what we're talking about, we gave you the, a little a little bit of an explanation. But you'd have to watch the last video to know the in great the detail. The, 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 but I, it, it, the question that I have, I think Joe. Now, we're picking up where we left off with Shall the Lord your God raise He's up that was in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Uh, we're going to pray very slowly through all this uh, history lesson, but let me stop there, verse th 39. So verse 36 through 39, uh, and I guess Ted's going to go first. Luke, Luke, go ahead Go ahead with Joe because I got kicked off the line and I just got back in the room, so let Joe go first, then I'll go. All right, Joe. Joe. Yeah, I'll be glad to. Luke, you're uh, you're freezing up uh, pretty bad. I, I you only were heard uh, actually reading one verse uh, of the of the four that you read or three or four that you read. Um, I I I think this is just uh, uh, letting them know that uh, uh, Moses uh, was a, a servant of the Lord and and uh, and brought them out of Egypt. Um, gosh, I'm going to have to reread it, Luke, because you broke up so bad. All I heard was one verse, and I'm trying to catch up without glasses. Uh, you might want to reread. You you did fade out except for one verse. All right. So this is uh, he's continuing talking about Moses. Uh, Moses brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him uh, in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Uh, was that uh, all heard? Yes, it was, Luke. It was. Uh, I think we're uh, we're talking about a, a visitation uh, by God. It was a Christophany or a, a, a theophany uh, to Moses, and uh, he was given the uh, the assignment to go rescue the people, and. Uh, uh, and my brain is freezing. For some reason, uh, I better get my glasses. I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to turn it back over to you and Ted right now. I'm sorry. All right, Ted, any, any thoughts on those scriptures? No, I think they pretty much speak for themselves, and the, the, the place of prominence that people like Abraham and Moses were given here, uh, I think Stephen's really uh, coming to make his point. So, uh, We'll leave it right there till you read on. Thanks, brother. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. There's nothing really needs to be said about that. He's just going on and explaining the significance of Moses. Um, 
uh, now verse 40, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Um, I, I guess I'll just I'll just go first on this these verses. That I don't. We're in a portion here where he's just running through all the history, and uh, even though he's been doing it since the beginning of this chapter, this particular portion I don't think there's anything that needs to be uh, elaborated on. But if you see something you think is you want to say something about go ahead well I, I'll just note that uh, you know they they started turning to gods of their own hands uh, and uh, and and uh, Aaron uh, uh, went ahead and and uh, brought up brought out the uh, the gods of Egypt among them I guess that's what it looks like all right Ted Nope, just continue on, brother. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, uh, for those people who have who have studied the Old Testament and know about all of these people and these uh, uh, these these events, uh, then this is uh, like a little Reader's Digest version of, of reading the Old Testament. Um, verse forty-three: Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them and will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness and he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles uh, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for uh, the God of Jacob. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read the whole thing uh, after you get your comments in the Amplified. Uh, sometimes it just things get a little bit more clear when you read that one. So uh, go ahead, uh, your thoughts. If uh, I, I'm going first, now, first now I guess uh, this is new to me. Uh, it looks like he's talking about uh, that Moses uh, is the one after they uh, dispatched with the gods of uh, Egypt. Uh, they made the uh, Ark of the Covenant. It appears they took the gold, perhaps that had been made for the the Moloch statue and whatnot, and fashioned the Ark of the Covenant in the way in a that God it or that Moses had seen or had been shown by God on how to make and uh, the possession of that Ark of the Covenant or the dwelling place of God amongst them uh, was uh, with them all the way till the time of David is what I see being said here. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, well, I, I nobody changed the order, but so I don't know why you are because no one else was talking. All right, well, you just give Ted a little more chant time, and he'll go. Ted, you're still going first, I guess. Go ahead. Oh, that's fine. Uh, the, thing I, the thing I think I see here is he's pointing out, uh, you know, God had uh, guys that were faithful in the midst of this, you know, he had in the midst of their rebellion, and then uh, there were also, uh, you know, despite their leaders, they were, you know, uh, making uh, golden calves. They were... Uh, making uh, sacrifices to, to Moloch and all. So God's saying, listen, there were true voices uh, throughout all this time. There, were, there was David, there was Moses, Abraham. There was always, always these faithful guys. And then there's all along there, there's the majority, which uh, didn't seem to want to go along with God's program. That, that's what I'm getting out of this, brother. Well, I'm going to read it all in the Amplified, and it's just simpler English to understand. So we'll probably... 
uh, you know, realize some things we didn't notice the first time. But first, let me get back to a question or a point that Joe made earlier, and, and I think it's a very good question. It's, uh, uh, and I'm not sure I have a great answer, but uh, we said earlier that uh, yesterday, or I mean the last uh, study on this, that uh, this chapter seven, Stephen's historical account of all these things. Um, it's, it's a kind of connecting all the dots from Abraham to Christ. Now, why does he cover some of the things that seem to be, um, maybe, the, in my opinion, I feel probably half of these verses he didn't even have to mention. Uh, I don't know why he's, he's being so thorough in uh, some of the details that seem like they're, they're not as important to make the point that Abraham had a promise and it, it, uh, Moses prophesied about it too, and so on. And now, now this Jesus is the one that was promised. And uh, it seemed like he could have done this in uh, a fraction of the time. So why so much detail? Uh, think about that while I'm reading this whole thing in the Amplified. Um, starting with verse 36, I'll go back to that point. Uh, uh, this man led them out of Egypt after performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the children of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your countrymen. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles, that's divine words that still live, to be handed down to you. Our fathers were unwilling to subject to him and refused to listen to him. They rejected him, and their hearts turned back to Egypt. They said to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has happened to him. In those days, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced and celebrated over the works of their hands. But God turned away from them and handed them over to serve the host of heaven as is written and forever remains written in the book of the prophets. It was not really to me that you offered victims and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle, the portable temple of Moloch, and the star of the god Ramtha, Ram, Ramtha, the images which you made to worship, and I will remove you beyond Babylon, carrying you away into exile. Uh, I don't know. This is verse 44. I don't know if I got that far. Let me read a little more. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as God directed Moses to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. Our fathers also brought it in with them into the land, which with Joshua. So this uh, verse 45 is where I'll pick up here. So that's the whole thing in the Amplified. And this is one of the reasons I like reading the Amplified is uh, sometimes I read things, this whole portion of scripture in the KJV, and it, it was almost like reading a foreign language, some of it, and where it seems so much clearer with the Amplified. Even though I'm a KJV firstist, and I think we need to test the Amplified and test everything else against the KJV. Uh, sometimes the, the, the Amplified just is, uh, it's so much more clear what it's saying. Um, all right, so uh, I think uh, we agreed uh, Ted's still going to go first. But one thing, that the verses as a whole, and then the bigger question that Joe posed, why so much detail? Couldn't he have accomplished the same thing in a, a, a half or one-third of the points there? Well, I think he could have, but obviously he's full of the Holy Spirit. And I think we have to look at that, guys. I think we have to realize, you know, this is what God directed him to say to these people. God, uh, God's in the details. I mean, look at the situation, the, the tabernacle. Let me, let me interrupt for a second. My, my question is, is not uh, uh, about uh, pertaining to... Uh, if God directed him or not. We've all conceded that he's inspired. But I'm wondering, why does God, uh, through Stephen, want us to know every little detail, and why is it that way instead of, instead of let's say, uh, 
you know, five or six uh, main bullet points? That's the question. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was about to say that. But uh, the thing is, I believe God is directing him to say these details. That was my point, is God wants them to know that he's that God has worked so intricately with them through all these generations and through their uh, through their leaders and despite their rebellion. I think that's why there's so much detail in Stephen's message. I think yeah, he could have left a lot of it out, but obviously he's directed by God to put these things in. And and maybe there were some some of these distinctives that were commonplace talked about, you know, over the dinner table. Uh, you know, some of these, some of these scribes and Pharisees and these council members. Uh, maybe these these things are the things that the stories that they reiterated and retold to their children and their children's children. And maybe there was something about these stories and these things, maybe that were were commonplace in that culture that were talked about and known about. That Stephen wanted to say, hey, this is how God's work now. Now. He, we're, worked in your lives and all through these generations, folks need to read into this and look into this and see what God's been doing and how it's going to lead up to the deliverer that he promised. That That's what I'm seeing. Just I haven't thought about it till today, but that's what I'm seeing. All right, Brother Joe. Well, uh, something, something Ted said uh, sparked a memory and may have answered my question because I'm between what Ted said and there's a verse back here that talks about uh, uh, back in 40, 41, somewhere back here, it talks about how they wouldn't receive the prophets, uh, and, but yet uh, those outside of Israel would, something like that. The, the, the memory that came to me, and this isn't from my own understanding, but from a sermon I heard once, is that every major prophet of Israel was rejected by Israel. And, and the, the ones, now Samuel wasn't rejected by David, but he was rejected by Saul. Uh, so I think every major prophet, if not every prophet, has been rejected by Israel. And yet Babylon, or, or the uh, unsaved uh, Gentile world, has received their prophets. Uh, and again, back to, to Babylon and forward that many of the prophets of Israel were received by the Gentiles and and listened to and and uh, for instance Joseph to to uh, uh, Pharaoh and and uh, for a time Moses to Pharaoh all their major prophets were rejected by them and many if not all were accepted by those outside of Israel at one point or another and so maybe he's going major prophet to major prophet look rejection, 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 and he's going to work his way to Christ, the, the greatest and final rejection. Back to you, Luke. All right, I'll keep reading. It's uh, verse 45 in the KJV. Uh, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hands made all things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. All right, go ahead. Well, I think he's really uh, come to the point he wanted to make the whole, the whole time, and that is that uh, as your fathers did, so do ye. And I think it's really uh, important there where he said uh, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. I mean, I think that now we're talking uh, the, the problem that's we go all the way back to Adam, you know, ever since uh, man was, you know, what we call incomplete, you know, after the fall in the garden, uh, I believe, you know, the Spirit of God left Adam and Eve, uh, was no longer dwelling in them when they fell. I think that's why they, they felt uh, incomplete, uncovered. Unpresentable. So uh, 
he's really coming to a point here. He's, first of all, he says, first, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He said, I made it all. You know, I made the rocks and the, and the stones and everything that you guys are carving uh, temples out of or places out of. You know, heaven is my throne. I made everything. The earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? And then right then, he goes into verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like in the King James, there, Luke, you do get the plural, ye stiff-necked, you know. It's a plural, and it's talking about all of you collectively that have that been rejecting the Messiah, you know, while he was here on three and a half years on this earth, as your forefathers did reject the, the, the message of God's Spirit coming to you, you're doing the same thing. You're all guilty. You're all in one lot in your guilt. And that's the I think that's the culmination of what he's saying here, brother. Back to you. Okay, I'll keep reading. Uh, verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Uh, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. All right. Um, uh, I just realized, didn't I think I skipped Joe on that last time? That those last verses, bro, Joe, you didn't uh, get a chance. Sorry, I got confused. You. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, sometimes it's much better if you if you do miss me, uh, Luke. <laughs> Trust me. But uh, in this in this occasion, uh, I, I uh, echo, of course, what Ted had said. Uh, I do think that he built a bridge between the uh, Old Testament prophets and Christ uh, when he when he discussed uh, first of all earlier in the chapter, just a few verses back, he was making reference to the Ark of the Covenant, which was carried uh, with the the people, and how Solomon uh, built the temple. And it, but God dwells in the heart, and His kingdom is of the heart, uh, not in a structure. And I think that's that's taking the teachings of Christ and showing uh, them that we've crossed a bridge here, and and all these people prophesied of the coming one, and now you guys have uh, done just what your fathers did with the prophets that told he was coming, and that and and you slew him, and so uh, uh, he's telling them, hey, listen, you had the law, and you haven't kept it, and. Uh, uh, now you, you've slain the one that the prophet said was coming, and he's making the reference again between the, the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle uh, in which it was kept and the heart that Christ spoke of, the kingdom being within us. And that's all I have to say. Back to you, Luke. All right. So Joe went first this time. Ted, what are your thoughts? Well, I just want to uh, concur with just what Joe said there. Uh, I mean, this, he's really, uh, Stephen would have made a very good lawyer, I think, because he's, he's building his points, and I think uh, they didn't realize at first this just seems like a, like a history lesson to them, and then the things he's laid out is guilt, 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 and uh, verse 52 uh, goes back to what Joe brought out earlier. And that is, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? I mean, he asked the question, it's like, when were, when were your forefathers ever, ever not persecuting the prophets that God sent? I mean, not like you guys did okay most of the time, but you guys slipped up here and there along the way, and you guys really kind of just missed the mark in some ways, and we just need to get that corrected, and then you guys will be all hunky-dory. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, you guys have been screwing up for generations. Which of your uh, prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. The prophet that, that said, hey, the Messiah is coming, and he's promised. You guys killed, killed the ones that gave you the message. 
not only uh, you know uh, put away their message, but put away the men themselves. So uh, that's what I'm getting out of this, brother. Back to you. Can I can I put a tag tagline to what Ted just said, Luke? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's ironic. Two things I, I find ironic. Number one is that after their forefathers did slay and persecute all the prophets, they now hold all those prophets in the highest esteem. I mean, let's face it, to, to say anything against Moses is, is blasphemy. Uh, but, uh, you know, so now they hold each and every one of these prophets uh, through, the, through their writings in the highest esteem, but at the time they crucified, or they crucified, but, but uh, uh, persecuted them. And I also think it's a, it's a neat thing to remember that Joseph and Daniel and uh, 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 Samuel and just Isaiah, all these prophets were accepted in the Gentile nations and, and, uh, and uh, for one great purpose or another. And uh, uh, so I think it's ironic that, they, that the prophets that were persecuted by Israel were often accepted in the Gentile nations. So uh, now, now that they're, they put all these guys on a pedestal, uh, Stephen's reminding them, yeah, 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 but back at the, in the day, <laughs> you know, you treated them like you treated Christ. So uh, just a little bit of irony there. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. The uh... Uh, you know, this much of this reminds me of uh, Jesus's parable. I I don't know if the parable has a title or if I'm identifying it right, but it, I think it's about the rich landowner who uh, um, he let he let his land to be used, and they were supposed to pay him, and he kept on sending people to collect, and they kept killing them, and finally he sent his own son, thinking that they'd respect him, and they killed him. Uh, I think Jesus, he used that parable to, to make this same point. It's just, to me, it's a little shorter, condensed version, uh, but Steve is doing the same thing. Uh, but it's, it's clear it's, he's not using a parable. He's, he's specifically identifying names. He's, he's, he's naming names. Um, but the reaction, we've talked about this, I think, the last time or two. The, the entering the reaction that uh, Peter was getting in his sermons put, uh, by the, the, the public as a whole. Thousands were being converted when he gave his sermon. Uh, but the, the, the religious leaders, uh, they were the ones that were clenching their teeth. And, you know, and here's, another, here's another one. They were, they were, it says... Uh, the, the, the people who got converted, they were pricked in their hearts and be, repented and believed, but the people who wouldn't believe, they were also, it says they were cut to the heart, but instead of repenting and believing, they gnashed on him with their teeth, which I don't think it means they went and bit him. It just means that their facial expressions show great anger and hatred for him. Uh, all right, I'm going to go on to verse 55. Uh, uh, but he, uh, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Uh, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and, uh, and ran upon him with one accord. And, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So verses 30, uh, 30 34, 54 through 58, your thoughts on that? Well, uh, this is really coming to a point. And uh, I think we touched on the time before last when I was with you guys about the, the, the expression gnashed at him with their teeth. It's a, a, just an expression of indignation. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, looked up, you know, gazed into heaven. And uh, 
I, I think you guys might can come up with something, but to me there's got to be something here with Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Um, I don't know. I've, I've struggled with this. I've heard some dispensationalists say that uh, if the Jew, the Jewish leadership at that time would have uh, been cut to the heart in the right way and repented and believed on Christ as Messiah, that Christ might have been ready to come back and set up the kingdom. I don't know. I just... Uh, but seeing what happened is they, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and, and went against Stephen. So I, I it's rather than making a comment, I'd like to know you guys' impression on, on the, the phrase there, Jesus standing at the right hand of God, because uh, that's that's something I don't understand. Back to you. Yeah, well, I, I thought that that would be an interesting point that uh, you, would want to, you and Joe would want to discuss. Uh, Joe, your thoughts on this? Yeah. This is this is the highlight of the whole chapter for me. Uh, you know, I, I never pre-read or I try not to, uh, so everything's fresh and, and everything for me. As a student, I'm not a teacher, so that's good. But you know, uh, that's the one thing I remember out of this chapter. And what I believe, uh, I am a dispensationalist, but I I don't know that 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 had anything to do with it. It says, you know. Uh, don't sit in the front of the church, sit in the back, and God may honor you and put you in the front of the church, uh, in, in so many words, I forget how that parable goes, but, you know, I think this was simply a case of God honoring Stephen. Uh, I, I, I'm just overwhelmed at the thought, you know, I, I had a, a dream once where, uh, where I was, uh, in heaven, and, and Christ called me friend, and I, I it was such a vivid, overwhelming uh, thing. I've never forgotten it. It seems so real, but just that one word. Can you imagine Christ standing to receive you into heaven? Uh, I think Christ was honoring Stephen. Uh, he was a special man for a special time, for a special cause, and uh, the first servant, the first deacon, uh, I think Christ honored him, and so uh, I think that's all that is, and and I'm overwhelmed at the thought. Uh, so you know, Christ does look at us uh, in a way that we don't often think. He looks at us not only as our God, but as our brother and our Lord. And so uh, for him to stand next to the Father and, and receive him. And that aside, one thing that I was struck new. By was that uh, he saw this before they started stoning him. He saw this vision at the end of his speech before he was taken out of town. So a good t a bit of time elapsed from the time he saw Christ to the time they drug him out, took him outside of the town, and then stoned him. All of this happened before the stoning, which I don't think anybody... Has, I've never heard anyone mention that. Uh, so uh, this vision he had was not during the stoning like I had always thought, but before they even drug him out of the temple and then had to take him out of town. So uh, yeah, the, there's a there's a time lapse between the stoning and the and this awesome vision. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Well, brother Joe, do you know what I think of your comment? <laughs> I'm going to stand up out of respect for that. So a little applause. Of all the comments you've made over the years, that might be one of my favorite comments. I've never heard anybody even mention the, the, the two points you made. I've never heard mentioned by anybody. But I absolutely agree with both points. And, um, you know, I... I have some playlists that you'd have to go watch to get a great, a better understanding of what I'm going to say next. Uh, one is dispensational. One is called dispensationalism, futurism, preterism, historicism, millennialism. It's a lot of isms there, but it's all about um, how to understand these things as history is playing out. And uh, uh, the other one is the Paul onlyism. Uh, and that the Paul only uh, Paul onlyus that that playlist uh, it debunks. I, it's titled Paul onlyism debunked. 
<clears throat> and but Paul only is and some other dispensationalists, they would immediately uh, take the position that Ted offered up. Not that he said he, this is the position he agrees with, he said this is the position he's heard. But uh, they, I think that, that they take, they hold, do hold to the position that there was actually a point in time where Jesus was standing, and if they had uh, accepted Stephen, the, these Jewish people, then he would have come back and, you know, things would have been totally different. And uh, uh, to me, that's absolutely absurd to think that God is standing waiting for a decision so he can decide how to react. Don't they know that God knows all things? He knows how everything's going to play out. It's not going to hinge upon what's going to happen. Is not, does not hinge upon whether they're... Uh, listening to Stephen or stoning him. It's just, to me, that whole idea is just absurd that uh, because the Jewish, they had their last chance and and they were, didn't listen to Stephen, they stoned him, so now Jesus, he, he was standing ready to come and, and now he's sitting back down and, and for that reason, now the gospel was offered to the 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 the, uh, the Gentile world. It wouldn't have even been offered to the Gentile world according to the, these people. If 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 they had listened to Stephen, then Jesus would have come back right then, and we have no gospel gospel for the Gentiles according to them. Right? It's just to me, it's it's just all absurd. But the idea that he was standing out out of respect for Stephen is is I've never heard anybody express it. I, I really think that's the right. The right way to in interpret it, and then the time frame that you mentioned, uh, I never really occurred to me before, and I think that's a very, very good point too. As we read further, maybe we can think more about how the significance of that. But uh, before I read on, I give you first. Let me get ask Brother Joe to go first and react to my great admiration okay. comment. Well, I'm I'm, I'm honored. Uh, Luke, that was very, very kind of you. Uh, you know, it's so funny, guys. Uh, sometimes, like, for up until this point, I was like, man, I should hang up because I'm just drawing blanks and I really don't have anything to offer. And I, I just, you know, I'm taking up time uh, where these two guys who are much more learned could be discussing things that people would actually be interested in. And so, uh, the fact that God may have given me a point to make uh, is very encouraging, and uh, that's not false humility. That's just the fact. I, I sometimes, often feel like just stupid, you know, foggy, and uh, so I, I so much appreciate you giving me that honor, Luke. That makes me feel very good, I, as it is it with anybody, and so thank you for that. Uh, but yeah, it's just. Uh, fascinating study to, to see things that, that uh, I haven't seen before. And I, if we hadn't been doing the study, I wouldn't have seen that. And I think maybe God showed it to me. I don't know. But it just, it just uh, for some reason, almost welled up uh, uh, tears when I thought about the, how beautiful it was for Stephen to have that kind of honor from Christ, for Christ to bestow that kind of honor on him. And so uh, just... I'm glad I did the study and didn't hang up and, and fake out like uh, my connection was bad. <laughs> so whether I say anything else good today or not, I don't know. But uh, that was a good thing to learn. Back to you, Luke. Uh, all right. Very good. Uh, God, I hope you don't ever get discouraged thinking like you're, you know, you're not don't have any good answers today. So you uh, don't ever throw in the towel and because you never know. Look, 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 that to me was brilliant and. Uh, um, I'm sure you have a lot more nuggets for us uh, as we go along. But now this gets back to Ted's original question where he he says, this is what he heard. He understands some people see it this way. He's unsure. What are your thoughts now after listening to Joe and me, Brother Chad? Well, uh, I've, I've never really fully agreed with that, like I said, what I what I had heard from dispensationalists, and it's mainly I think maybe the mid acts, what would be the, called uh, mid acts dispensationalists that believe, you know, now God had to raise up Paul, you know, to go to the Gentiles. But um, I, I really firmly now uh, and have have seen uh, before that 
God kept giving the Jews chances over and over. If we go through Acts, I mean, where did Paul go? He kept going to the Jew first. And even, even when he wrote to the Romans, he said the gospel is to the Jew first. So obviously God hadn't set them aside. So I don't know why uh, some dispensationalists see this this way. So obviously I, I think there's something to what Joe was saying about Christ standing uh, as, as being honoring to Stephen for, for the things he was saying, for the boldness and, and the preciousness of his faith. And uh, that's about all I have on that, brother. Okay, I'm going to read on. Uh, um, so here we have the first reference to Saul. I'll start with verse 58 again. Um, oh, I'll go with 57 because I like this the way this is stated here. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And I think, uh, I think it was uh, Brother Joe was talking about how they covered their ears once before. It says, uh, I guess this happened to me one time when I was, uh, it, when I was working, I had a, I was a supervisor and I gave some order, you know, I, I don't mind, it wasn't like I was really ordering some around, but when you're, when you're, uh, you're, you're supervising an employee or employees, you have to tell them what to do sometimes, and they, they're not supposed to do something without getting an okay. So we have this procedure, and this person, I, I was told him something, I don't remember the details, but this actual person in public, this is in the middle of a, this is in a casino, because I was a like a pit boss in a casino supervising the dealers as they're working. And this dealer, as she's dealing to people, and, and her response to, to my order to her, was this, and she was dead serious. It wasn't like a, she was being friendly and just being humorous, you know. She covered her ears, and it was just so disrespectful. And my boss, who happened to be in a conversation with me right at the time, she didn't even care. I was her boss, and he, my boss was even there. She didn't even care. She was just like uh, disrespecting me and, and him at the same time. But it is a really disrespectful thing for a person to do that. And this, this is literally covering your ears. Some people cover their ears um, without physically doing it. It's just they tune you out. They're no longer listening. I, I find that to be a very common practice on YouTube that people don't really listen to each other, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, so um, yeah, they stopped their ears and ran up upon him with one accord, so they were all in agreement, and cast him, Stephen, out of the city so Brother Joe's just certainly would take a period of time. I don't know if it was five minutes or 30 minutes or an hour that it took, but a, a period of time from the time this vision of, uh, of Stephen started. And, and I don't know, maybe there was more in the vision too that, uh, that we're not told about. Maybe it was continuous or maybe it was broke. Uh, um, no, there's not two parts to it. I, I was thinking there was more to the vision as he was dying. but um, And cast him out of the city and stoned him, and witnesses laid down their clothes at the young, a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Uh, and, of course, Saul, we know later, becomes the Apostle Paul. Uh, but So Saul is there. It doesn't say that he's throwing stones, but he's certainly in agreement with everybody and giving them moral support by holding their coats while well, they stone him, it says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Well, the way, the way that's written, it, it's a little confusing. It's Stephen that's calling on God, not the, the crowd, of course. And they stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, verse 60, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. All right, Brother Ted, I'm sure you're dying to talk about that. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Brother. Without getting into verse 60 right now, um, I, I just want to say that what I'm really feeling in this is just, uh, a, a just I'm just, it's it's sad. That's it's all I can say about it. It's so sad to see the, the way these people responded. I mean, they had John the Baptist. Uh, to come on the scene, the forerunner. 
Then they have the earth and ministry of Christ. Then they have uh, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and then chapter uh, 3, where uh, more thousands get saved. And we know multitudes are believing on Christ. Christ performed all these, all these miracles during his earthly ministry. God raised him from the dead. And I mean, now, and here's Stephen, and someone apparently so, so meek and so forgiving. I just have a sinking feeling in my heart. I'm almost beyond words, and I've read this a hundred times, but it just, it, it is really sad for me to see uh, this uh, type of, of willful ignorance, ignoring uh, God's uh, revealed tr truth, ignoring God's message to them, ignoring uh, and willfully putting putting themselves uh, apart from God's will. Uh, to me, it's just, uh, I'm at a loss for words. It's, it's really hitting me today. It just seems really sad to me that they're doing this to themselves. All right, thanks. Brother Joe? Yeah, uh, you know, again, as usual, uh, echoing Ted, it is. It, it, and it's also scary because it's almost like, uh, you know, it's funny when you see the kids in the schoolyard. You ever see them? They put the plug in their ears and go, la, 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 la. When someone says something they don't want to hear, you know, you get that humorous thing. But this is almost uh, just totally rageful and, and insane. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the way it, you know, it, it feels is that they're just losing their minds. And, uh, you know, it, it, it says that Stephen said, behold, I see the heavens open. You know, he told them what he saw. And, and that made them nuts. And, you know, it, it, it occurs to me also that Christ could have showed himself to the Sanhedrin. You know, he was uh, around for 40 days. I think you guys will correct me if I'm wrong. But he walked around and showed himself to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in addition to, to the uh, disciples. But he chose not to make an appearance at the temple, which he could have done. And uh, so uh, I think I think uh, the Lord knew their hearts were black, and uh, and uh, he just chose not to appear to them. Uh, it's like in the Garden of Eden: don't let them eat of the you know tree of life, otherwise they're going to be in their state like this forever. So uh, yeah, it's it, it's uh, both heartbreaking and scary to me. It, it's it's almost like a horror movie to think of, you know, them losing their minds like that uh, at what at what Stephen said and what God loved so much He honored him. So, yeah, this is this is a crazy little portion of scripture. Hmm. Well, uh, so to me, there's significant things that uh, we we. We've got Saul mentioned for the very first time. Now his teacher was mentioned earlier. I think it was in the last chapter, Gamaliel, and we learned about how respected Gamaliel was as the most learned teacher in uh, Judaism, and that we also learned that later on Paul will talk about how he was his student and he sat at his side his whole life and learned from him. Uh, so, so this Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, um, there's going to be a transition. Uh, I don't remember how soon it is, but the book of Acts seems to be primarily about Peter. And of course, John and the other apostles are mentioned, but mostly it seems to be about Peter is the main character in the first part of Acts. And then the second part of the book of Acts uh, Paul becomes the main character. Uh, so this Saul will become Paul. Uh, you know, there's another thing, you know, I, I, I don't know, I just don't really love to do it, but I, I feel like compelled to do this often, and that is just keep on arguing against these false teachings of the, the Paul Olius. Another thing, I, what I've done is I've taken every one of their positions, and, and um, refuted it, and it's very easy to do. So whatever they say, I've addressed it in my series. Um, I would love to have any Paul only us. Uh, if they even watch my videos anymore, they probably don't even watch me anymore. I used to be friends with a bunch of them. 
But once I started speaking out against their false teachings, um, they probably don't watch my videos. But if any Paul only is actually would watch my series refuting their, their positions, I'd love to hear their responses, but no one has dared to give me answers for, for my uh, all the points that refute their positions. But here's, a, here's another one, and, and, and that is that uh, um, it says that um, um, this, is, this is Stephen, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, where have we heard this kind of a thing before? From Jesus on the cross. Jesus said, "Don't uh, don't hold these sins against against the people who were just." I, I I'm not sure if he was talking about the Romans who were nailing him to the cross, or or the Sanhedrin who forced the trial, and he would have been on the cross and nailed to the cross if they hadn't first uh, arrested him and convicted him and insisted upon it. So, but maybe it's all of them. Maybe it's the whole world. But, but the point is, we get this as an example set by Jesus. And the, the, the thing that I'm getting around about saying for about paul onlyism is that they always say Paul is our example, not Jesus. We're supposed to be followers of Paul. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And they take that verse to mean we're not supposed to follow Christ. We follow Paul. They're reading a lot more into that statement than, there's, than they should. Uh, we are, Jesus set an example. Uh, he, he, he said, the, re the reason he came down from heaven, he said, do not think that I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for others. He served in so many ways. And, and he, when he washed the feet of the apostles, he would, did this to teach them and to give them an example of how to, how to be, how to be a servant and be humble. He set examples for us to follow and uh, for us to, to think that uh, we're not supposed to follow Christ's example anyway. Just Paul is insulting. I'm, I'm actually so insulted by their position of Paul onlyism that they, they diminish the teachings and example of Jesus. They diminish John, they diminish Peter, and elevate Paul above everybody. And it's it's a, it's horrible. Um, as much as I love Paul and admire him, he may be the greatest apostle, but he he should not be having that position that that they take. It's it's extreme and insane. Um, so there's my rant against Paul Onlyism for the day. Uh, uh, I can't remember where we were, and uh, let me go back and give each of you a chance to talk about these last verses. I don't even remember if you said anything yet. Uh, go ahead. Well, Luke, I did, uh, I did comment on those, uh, and I think the example of Stephen is just following the example of, of, of Christ, as you know, like you said, brother, you said it all, Christ uh, came as a minister, Christ came as a servant, you know, being so humble to wash the, the feet of the disciples, I mean, you said it all, brother, I just want to say amen and double amen to what you said, and from my experience with the Paul only, is, uh, you're, you're right on target about them, you're not, uh, you're not exaggerating. Back to you. All right, thank you. And Brother Joe? Uh, I, I don't have anything to add, except I was thinking that I, I was having a, some private communication with a, a Paul Onlyist a, a couple weeks ago, and uh, uh, it was kind of funny because uh, some of the points that were really compelling brought out the uh, stuffing of the ears and the yelling and gnashing of teeth. It's like when, you know, if you make a really good point against someone who's so doctrinally inclined uh, to one point of view, uh, it often in in enacts rage uh, in some people, and uh, kind of like the Pharisees there. Uh, I think you know the Paul onlyists are usually the best of brothers, so I'm not saying anything against their salvation or anything like that. But uh, yeah, you can really get caught up into a, a doctrine. And, and just be unable to, to see your way out of it, I guess. Uh, all right. Um, now, there are probably some people watching this video and this even maybe watched the series from the beginning, 
and you might not really even know when I keep on uh, referring to the the Paul Onius. Another more, more common name. I I kind of coined the term Paul Onius. I've never heard anybody use that term before. Uh, I've always there in the books the theologians that write about these uh, different uh, um, camps, theological camps. Uh, the theologians they usually call their, their, that, that group of people. Um, rather than Paulonius, they're called hyper dispensationalists. Um, and there's another another name, and it's it, it's even a more extreme. That see that the hyper dispensationalist thinks that you can only save get saved uh, by listening to Paul's writings, and 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 Paul was the first one to be in the church. None of the apostles were even Christians, as we understand it. They were still just uh, uh, you know Old Testament uh, you know save Old Testament way. Uh, but the uh, so the, the ultra dispensationists they not they don't not only believe that um, you, Paul was the first one in the church and and that uh, uh, you can only get uh, saved by listening to Paul not Jesus John or Peter uh, but the ultra dispensationists they say not only that Paul didn't even get saved until he was in prison and he the gospel was not even made. Uh, made clear and, and didn't, there was no gospel for the church. The church didn't start until Paul's prison days. That's the ultra dispensationalist view. So these are, they're both wrong. There's one is just even more extreme than the, than the other. So if, if you're hearing these terms uh, for the first time and you need, want to know more about it, then go to my playlist and I have a very thorough teaching uh, against it. Now my question to Brother Joe and Ted now is, uh, uh, this is the end of the chapter. Uh, do we want to go uh, for, try to say, a 90-minute uh, session today or two hours? If you want to go two hours, we can. We'll go into the next chapter. But if you want to go limit it to 90 minutes, then that then we have probably enough time for summaries and a gospel message. Would you guys have any preference? Um, I'll go with with either way you guys decide, Luke. I mean, if you want to cut it cut it uh, in summary and then start afresh with the next chapter next time, that's fine with me. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I agree with uh, what Ted just said. Okay, so it, it, it seems that both of you are uh, inclined to, to uh, stop, make it a ninety minute uh, session. That's fine. Um, all right, so that. That gives us plenty of time now for each of us to give our summary thoughts about the study as a whole today, uh, and and then I'll have a few minutes in the end for a gospel message. Uh, Brother Ted, uh, you're supposed to be going first today, so I guess we still are. Okay, well, I don't know what, if I could add anything that hasn't been said already. Uh, this We're mainly just going through uh, Stephen's... Uh, history lesson, as you said, the, the Reader's Digest version of the Old Testament, and he's just given them exactly what they need to hear, and uh, and they don't receive it. Uh, like I said, I'm, I really, uh, I find this passage of Scripture very disheartening, and at the same time, we, we look at the nobility of, of Stephen and his, and his courage, uh, and his knowledge of the Old Testament, and just him being available to God to speak to those people exactly what they need to hear. And maybe this is an example for us guys. Maybe uh, as hard as it is uh, and the reactions that we might receive from some people, maybe we just need to stay bold, even if there's a, a unified resistance to the message. Uh, that's that's all I got, brother. All right. Um, brother Joe, could you sum up the study and, and any, any, highlight, any highlights that you want to mention? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it seems as though, uh, first of all, I, I do want to say something that occurred to me that I didn't think of earlier, and that is that uh, Stephen and the other uh, seven, six more uh, people that were chosen as deacons, which in their vernacular meant servant, uh, is that uh, none of them were chosen because of their spiritual gifts. 
None of them were chosen because of their standing. They were chosen for character traits. And the character traits were honesty, uh, 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 you know, just, just the things that, that we would choose friends or, or deacons today by. Uh, they, were, they were not uh, uh, anything special. They were just special in their fact that they had good character. And uh, uh, then afterwards, Stephen here is showing the uh, Pharisees that all through the history of Israel, they rejected the prophets and, re and rejected uh, the message of the prophets. And the prophets all point towards the one that was coming, and now they've rejected him. And uh, um, everything else Ted said, uh, ditto to that. Absolutely very sad. Uh, and, and to me, I'm going to add scary, because I, I could see myself being a Pharisee if I were alive in that day, um, as, as many of us could probably. Um, so... Uh, this is the this is the land bridge, the first martyr. Uh, so the church has officially uh, had blood on its hand, or the Pharisees have someone other than Christ's blood on their hands, and uh, we're entering the church age here. So, very fascinating study, Luke. Yeah, it was very interesting, and and, and I I posed a question at one point. Uh, it seemed like we're we're reading a lot of verses that we really don't have a lot to say about. It doesn't seem to be that significant. None of us even had much commentary on it. We're kind of at a loss. And I'm wondering why so much. Uh, obviously, Jesus accomplished the same thing in his parable of the of the the rich landowner that I referenced earlier, and it was very succinct. Why so much? detail I still don't really know yet know but uh, I, I I will say that to me the highlight of the study was uh, brother Joe's uh, uh, teaching on the standing of Jesus and uh, I for a long time I've rejected this the dispensationalist viewpoint the standing was that he might possibly return at that very moment uh, depending upon how they responded Stephen's sermon, I, I rejected that, but I didn't have a really uh, a good answer to why he was standing. And I think I do now. I think it, it all it makes sense to me. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, re regarding Joe, you might have been a Pharisee. You know, you, you are really uh, uh, self... Uh, what is that when a person uh, criticizes themselves a lot? There's a lot, some words for that, but you're a little hard on yourself. <laughs> I, I know me better than you do. <laughs> I doubt very much that you or Ted or I, or a lot of people, you know, I, I think we would have been on the side of just joyful believers. Um, maybe we would have had a lot of fear knowing that by, by believing in Jesus, it's kind of signing our own death sentence. Uh, uh, eventually, you know that but believing is going to cost you your life. So there may have been some fear accompanied with it, but um, we would have been persuaded. And because Jesus, as, as it says in the very beginning of the book of Acts, uh, Luke phrases it, that there were many infallible proofs. And Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. And they weren't even denying that he did the miracles. Instead, they, their answer was, well, they're miracles, but God's not working through you, it's the devil. So they were so desperate to reject him that they would even resort to that in, 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 the, in the face of all the miracles that they, they saw were true, truly miracles. And it's the same thing with the apostles here in Acts. They're performing miracles, many signs and wonders. The example of the man that was healed in the last chapter uh, uh, is the same thing. The many people, they saw it. The, the sense, Sanhedrin had no answer for it. They said, what can we do? We can't deny it. It's clear to everybody it was really a miracle. So what are we going to do? Um, so with, in the face of all those miracles, you can react in two ways. And also, if you add in the preaching of Peter, which was probably the greatest preaching ever, 
as far as results in the world. I can't think of any 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 preacher in the Bible or any place that, that got the kind of results Peter got. So if we had heard Peter, and if we were witnessing these miracles, or particularly if we had met Jesus, um, I, I don't think we would have been these stubborn, stiff-necked people that uh, would uh, clench our teeth, and, and uh, we would have uh, been the, said our, our hearts are pricked, and now we repent and believe. Uh, we've changed our mind, no longer rejecting Jesus. Now we say He is the promised one. Uh, that's the that's the side that we would have fallen into. I'm quite confident. Uh, now let me uh, get a brief. Uh, yeah, I got a few minutes left for, for a gospel message. Uh, when we say gospel, I, I guess it's important to understand the word gospel. See. The Bible has four books that are called Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, people refer to them as the Gospels. Um, but, but when we say Gospel, uh, the, the way it's used regarding one's salvation is it's a message uh, telling you how, what you have to do if you want to go to heaven. The Gospel is a Greek word that just literally translates to good news. The good news is that uh, it's uh, real simple and it's real easy. Jesus kind of compared it to being yoked. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Being yoked to Jesus is, uh, is like our spirit and the Holy Spirit of God being yoked together and connected. And now we're, we're, uh, our spirit, we're spiritually alive. The Holy Spirit's in us. We're recognized as a child of God. And for that to happen, it's just so easy. We just put our faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit regenerates us so it's easy and and the burden he said the burden is light that he says I'll condense all the rules instead of trying to follow all these religious rules they had 613 laws in Judaism and then the rabbis over the centuries had added all kinds of other there's probably thousands of other rules that were added to make this religion so rigorous so so legalistic every little detail was a rule a law, but he says, I'm going to just get rid of that and replace it with love God and love each other. So this is really what God asks of us uh, once we put our faith in Jesus. So to be a, a, a Christian, uh, you know, I'm purposely pronouncing it Christian because I want to emphasize it's about Christ, not about us. To be a Christian, uh, the, the way that we would define it in the Bible, uh, uh, all, the, all that we need to do is uh, rely completely on Christ. If someone believes they're going to go to heaven, not because of anything that they've done, not through any personal merit, but they're going to go to heaven because of what Christ has done for them, then they are a Christian because they're relying on Christ. They're depending completely on Him, and they're believing on Him for their salvation. They're trusting Him instead of thinking that they're going to somehow achieve it on their own. So it's important for people to understand that heaven is not a reward for good behavior. But this is what the religions of the world all teach you. Yes, be a good person and join these religions and follow all the rules of the religion. And if you're good enough, maybe God will approve of you and let you in. But the Bible says that's man's invention. It's not God's way. God's way is admit you could never be perfect and that's why you need the Savior, Jesus Christ. We've all sinned. None of us can say we're perfect to God at the judgment. So we have to instead say, I know I haven't been perfect, but Jesus is my perfect Savior. So I'm relying on him. Now, Jesus, I want you to know about a little bit about him. He's not just a prophet. He's not an angelic being that God created. He is God himself, eternal God Almighty, who came down from heaven and became a man. Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, and he said the reason he became a man was, as we said earlier, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. So Jesus gave his life as a ransom. What did he set you free from? He set you free from judgment and condemnation. See, he paid for all of our sins, Years, if you're watching this now, he paid for your sins 2,000 years ago. From the time you're born to the time you die, all those 
our sins were cast back in time and put on Jesus on the cross. It says he became sin for us. He was so covered with the world's sin, it seemed like he was sin. And so the sins are paid for. You should say, thank you, Jesus. Now you're acceptable to God, and you can receive eternal life and go to heaven, but not without faith in Jesus. Uh, Jesus says he's the only way. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So you've got to reject all other ways, reject any other person like Buddha, Muhammad, the Pope, or the Virgin Mary, and reject your own ability and say, I'm incapable of of living a high enough standard that God would accept me. That's why uh, Jesus is the only way. I'm trusting him. Now, after they killed him and buried him, he raised himself back to life bodily, and that bodily resurrection was um, provided for us, for our benefit, so we could see that, that there, he gave us proof that he is our Savior God. And, and he is, uh, not, just as he raised himself from the dead, he will raise us to life everlasting. Um, because we put our faith in him, we'll have life everlasting. So put your faith in Jesus now, and I'll give each of you brothers a chance to say any last words. Uh, brother go, Ted, go ahead. No, brother, thank you for that, and always presenting a clear gospel message of grace. That's how we're saved, and that's how we stand. And Thank you for bringing that out, brother. All right, thanks again, uh, Brother Joe. Yeah, I just uh, I always appreciate your gospel message, and uh, I I uh, always tagline it. Uh, you know, as simply as I'm a sinner, save me, Jesus. That's that's basically all you need to do to enter into the family of God. All right, all right, uh, brothers. Thanks again for participating, and uh, we we're going to try to do these daily about 2:30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, if our schedules don't permit it, then we'll skip that day. But uh, we'll try to do it every day possible, and gradually we'll work our way and get through the book of Acts. So thanks for participating, and to the viewers, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.